Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. I'm sorry about that last video, it actually crashed in the middle of the making it. And I was just going to go ahead and continue with the Zero Hedge article on Bernanke's backpedaling. But uh, actually uh, a much better uh, article has come out from uh, Potter Tenenbaum. I'm going to go ahead and read that one instead. But before we do that, I want you to look at this chart here. Now this is uh, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and it is the uh, monthly. And you can see here that it goes all the way back to, you know, the early 1970s. Uh, so you can see here this arrow that I've drawn in here. This is pointing to the 1987 crash. This was the 87 market crash. And we know that this was the point in time where they created the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, also known as the Plunge Protection Team, to make sure that this sort of thing never happened again. And of course, what is the result? Well, you can see that the result of it was that as uh, there was a little bit of a downturn there in 1990 with the 1990 recession. Then as soon as the, uh, that was done and the resistance was overcome from that top, then you just have this run up, a uh, huge, huge dot com bubble that completely burst. Now it doesn't show as much in the Dow, but it was it does show in the NASDAQ index. A gigantic bubble that the Fed blew. And if you remember, Greenspan warned about irrational exuberance all the way back in here somewhere, I think. Ninety six, I think it was. Don't quote me on that. And then turned around and lowered interest rates and blew this enormous bubble up. And of course it crashed. We know what the results were. And then we had 911 and all that stuff and the Bush recession. And then we had uh, the early recession, Bush's first presidency. And then we had the Fed lowering interest rates, drastically cutting them like, I don't remember how many times, 9, 13 times. Unprecedented interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve. And they blew another bubble, which resulted in the financial crisis. Uh, and we know that one's fairly recent. An enormous crash that happened. Uh, Lehman bankruptcy, bankruptcy, Merrill Lynch bankrupt, uh, AIG bankrupt. Uh, countries, uh, companies going from hundreds of billions of dollars to zero overnight. Again, another huge financial collapse. And here we are again on another bubble. And you can see I've drawn in the lines of ascent. The lines of ascent were actually, and I, I should actually draw in, you know, the lines of ascent um, for these other ones. You can see this is actually the line of ascent for the 1987, um, uh, the base market run up. And then here's the, here's what we did up to the crash. So you can see that these two are parallel, but the line that we're currently on is actually steeper than any of these lines. Does that mean that it can't go up? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean it uh, can't go up more. It can go up a lot more. But it just shows you that they've blown another bubble ever since the Fed started interfering in markets. The only thing they can do is print money. We know this. That's what they do. That's their only solution. And now they're they're at zero interest rates and the stock market is at the top. Uh, what are they going to do? Well, they're in a bind. But let's look at... Uh, Potter Tannenbaum's recent one. Uh, read through this again. Same subject. Bernanke's backpedaling. Bernanke's first blog post. By now, it's probably made the rounds that Ben Bernanke has joined the blogosphere by beginning to write his own blog at the Brookings Institute. After reading his first post there, we couldn't resist a comment. The article is entitled, Why Are Interest Rates So Low? Perhaps not surprisingly, it turns out that it is essentially a long-winded apologia for the Fed's interventionist policies. At one point, Bernanke, e.g., deems it necessary to once again defend himself against a complaint voiced by a legislator, namely that the FOMC has, quote, thrown seniors under the bus. By cutting rates to zero, Bernanke is assuring us that, quote, I was concerned about those seniors as well. It could be that seniors will be happy to hear it. However, the return they get on their savings remains zilch to this day. So we doubt it will be much of consolation to them that Bernanke professes to have been concerned. He also tries to refute the fact that the Fed's interventions are distorting markets, i.e. he refuses to admit that it is blowing one bubble after another. 
It is interesting that Bernanke is launching into a justification of Fed policies in his very first post already. Reading it, we felt reminded of one of his previous attempts to exonerate the Fed when he argued that the housing bubble was the result of two lax regulations and had definitely nothing to do with the Fed's interest rate policies. Among other things, he neglected to mention in that particular speech that the housing bubble was actually concentrated in one of the most highly regulated sectors of the economy. And also it was something that he didn't see coming either that many people predicted, including Peter Schiff, and there were a large number of others. The natural interest rate. Bernanke tries to explain why the interest rates are currently so low and discusses the natural interest rate in this context. Quote, except in the short run, real interest rates are determined by a wide range of economic factors, including prospects for economic growth, not by the Fed. To understand why this is so, it helps to introduce the concept of the equilibrium real interest rate, sometimes called a Wixillian interest rate. After I'm not going to read it again because I read it yesterday. And uh, Potter says, It seems a bit unfortunate that economists are calling it the equilibrium interest rate. What Wixell described was the fact that there exists a time discount, a natural or originary interest rate that is independent of the height of market interest rates. Wixell's work has been incorporated and refined in the interest theories of later economists, inter alia the work of Frank Fetter in the U.S. and Ludwig von Mises in Austria, whom we quote at length. Human beings have a limited lifespan and time only moves in one direction for them. Time is an extremely important factor influencing our choices and actions. All action is future-oriented and aims at attaining satisfaction or removing uneasiness, as Mises put it. At some point in the future, human action is purposive and achieving a goal sooner is always preferred to achieving the same goal later. This is not a philosophical or psychological concept, but rather an essential, inviolable category of action, i.e. it's a praxeological theorem, as Mises explains. And I can't go through this whole thing. I'm just going to uh, read some more of the comments. Um, it, it goes very deep into economics, and uh, it's it's this argument about the natural interest rate. Of course, we, you know, it's all theoretical because we have fake interest rates. So, you know, we haven't had it for a very long time. We'll look at this chart here, but it says the exact height of the natural interest rate is not measurable. Gross market interest rates contain additional components, namely a price premium, which expresses expectations of the future decline in money's purchasing power and a risk premium, which reflects an assessment of the creditworthiness of borrowers and other risks attending a loan. This is also called an entrepreneurial premium since it produces an entrepreneurial profit for lenders who have estimated and priced this risk correctly. Nevertheless, these components of the gross market rate can of course be differentiated analytically. As an aside, this can also at least partly explain the existence of negative yields to maturity on some government bonds. Essentially, their risk premium has turned negative. They are believed to be safer than cash deposits held at banks. There is more to it than that, but this aspect plays definitely plays a role. Okay, and here's here's the the Fed funds rate. Now, if you remember, I showed you on that stock market chart uh, this drop here during this period, uh, the 2000 recession, that, that was the um, NASDAQ crash, uh, you can see how of uh, unprecedented uh, series of cuts they had to do to bring things back to the bubble that we're now at. And you can see that they were just cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting all the way down to zero. And that's where we're stuck. So this is unprecedented. So let's just go down to the conclusion. Central, blam, uh, central planners not to blame for distorting markets. We live in a world in which the supply of credit and money is literally expanded from thin air. And the central bank is at the center of this process. Even though in a normal boom, it will only accommodate the expansion of fiduciary media by commercial banks, whereas in recent years, it has pumped trillions of dollars into the economy directly Obviously, expanding the supply of money will not alter the amount of real capital and resources in the economy. Unfortunately, it does have other effects, though, and none of them are good. This brings us to Bernanke's attempt to deflect 
blame from the Fed for what it does best, namely distort markets. And I don't have time to uh, read the conclusion. I'm just going to read this final conclusion. In his first blog outing, Bernanke attempts to paint the Fed as a benevolent institution that cannot be held responsible for market distortions and economic cycles. It is true that the central bank has no control over the natural interest rate, but its interventions most assuredly do influence market interest rates. And with that relative prices in the economy, the attempt to exonerate the Fed therefore fails regardless of how well-intentioned its members may be. Their actions in concert with fractionally reserved banking cartel are the root cause of the boom-bust cycles that continue to bedevil the economy. Bubbles and busts in asset prices as reflected in the U.S. stock market, guess what comes next? And you can see that's the same chart that I've got up here. You can see what's coming next and what's going to come next for silver. Well, we know that it's the same people that are blowing these bubbles. They're the same people that are suppressing, uh, suppressing the precious metals. They've already admitted it. The folks over at GATA have documented the fact that the, I think it, was, uh, it wasn't Rubin, but it was uh, Lawrence Summers who admitted that manipulation of the gold price is essential for the manipulation of interest rates. So the two are tied at the hip. We know that they have to manipulate both of those to keep this thing going, to keep, as I've said before, this is like the guy up on the stage that has uh, all those plates spinning, like 50 plates spinning on those poles. And the thing is, is if one of them starts to fall, the thing, all of them come crashing down. That's what they're doing right now. They're ba- they're br- they have a balancing act. They're trying to balance all this stuff. But they've got interest rates at zero, stock market at all-time highs, and silver at an unbelievable low. This can't continue, and that's why Bernanke is backpedaling. And we'll talk to you next time.